Shalom. Uh, welcome. I'm Rabbi Scott with Beth Yeshua Messianic Synagogue in Fort Myers, Florida. We are reissuing the Revelation series that was taught by Rabbi Jim Pickens here at Beth Yeshua over the course of the last two years or so. We feel these messages are especially relevant in these tumultuous times, and we hope and pray that Adonai uses them uh, to strengthen you uh, and, and to encourage you. If you are currently a supporter of this ministry, we would like to say thank you. We appreciate your partnership with us as we all labor together in the work of the gospel of Yeshua uh, in the kingdom here on earth. Uh, if you would like to support us, you will find a link uh, below in uh, the video description. Once again, uh, we hope uh, that this is a blessing to you. If you have any questions, you will find an email address. Uh, if you have any dialogue or discussion, you'll find an email address in the video description below. Please reach out to us. We'd love to hear from you. And uh, now uh, I will give you the Revelation series with Rabbi Jim Pickens. Shalom. All right, good evening. We're going to talk about the Ten Kingdoms this evening. Let's go ahead and begin with the concept that what's been going on for over a hundred years now has gone largely unnoticed by the world's population. This business, this concept that's been going on for over a hundred years has largely been unnoticed by the world's population, including those who worship the God of Israel and his Messiah, Yeshua. It's been truly a clandestine operation, not that I think God wanted it that way, but he let it happen that way. Huge, but largely under wraps. Low profile might be a good term to use about the way that this last hundred years has been moving towards this ten kingdoms that are going to be set up to ultimately rule the world. It's been happening, some big things have been happening since World War I, but the ultimate goal has been to keep this as a low profile, to not get anybody excited, to just let it build and become a natural phenomenon as it goes through these many, many years. Reason, of course, is the ultimate goal is Hasatan's gaining control of our world and its population. The idea, our concept, was planted following the great population losses of World War I. That a world government needed to be set up and changed in the future to guarantee peace. I guess I should say charged in the future to guarantee peace. I'm not going to give you the history of World War I, just some statistics that, well, have driven the concerning figures to this concept that a guarantee of peace was needed and reworking how the world was governed was the only way to assure that goal of peace was the thinking following World War One. World War One was, as one group put it, a global war, was the first really of the global wars. There were 70 plus million military personnel that were mobilized overall during the time of World War I. There was an estimated 9 million combat deaths in World War I, and 7 million civilian deaths that were a direct result of the war. Add to that another 50 to 100 million deaths from genocides and the 1918 flu pandemic that took place that couldn't really be dealt with because of the war going on uh, in Europe. So the numbers have become staggering about World War I. But if we just limit ourselves to the 16 million deaths as a direct result of combat, that I believe is staggering enough for us 
it moved the leaders of the World War I victors to seek a solution to prevent this from ever happening again. I believe Hasatan sees an opportunity in this, a chance to rework the world in a manner that will put himself in charge while man is trying to rework the world to achieve something that he wants done. Hasatan wants to put himself in charge, make himself be the one that's worshipped, replacing the God of Israel. So let's look at the history of events from 1918 until now, which have brought us to the point of the prophetic ten kings slash kingdoms governing the world coming into place. So let's start with that prophecy itself. This is from a vision given to Daniel, if you will, and it's two parts. It's Daniel 7, 7, followed by Daniel 7, 23. So Daniel 7, 7 says, After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong, and it had great iron teeth that devoured and broke to pieces and stomped on the residue with its feet, and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. Then you take that from Daniel 7, 7 to 7, 23, towards the end of the verse, and it says, beginning in verse 23, Thus he said, The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down and break it in pieces at the end. Break it in pieces to me is pointing, I believe, to the ten kings or kingdoms that the world is going to be broken up into as we reach this end of the age that, that's coming up. Now, this is the fourth empire of man. It began with Rome just prior to Yeshua's first coming. We're now nearing the end of this fourth empire and actions being taken by victorious leaders of the world following World War I start the move to the prophesied ten world kingdoms coming into place. U.S. President Woodrow Wilson, Thomas Woodrow Wilson, the 28th president of the United States, he was president from 1913 to 1921, oversaw a passage of progressive legislative policies unparalleled until the New Deal came along under Roosevelt in 1933. Woodrow Wilson led the U.S. in World War I in 1917, and following the war he was the leader of the creation of the League of Nations. Kind of etch that into your minds. He really was the one that instigated all that. First global system set up for the rule of the world, the League of Nations. League of Nations really had its origins in a speech that Wilson pre presented to a joint session of Congress on January 8th of 1918 that was titled, The Fourteen Points. In this 14-point speech, Woodrow Wilson outlined his ideas for the creation of a system that would give the world stable, long-lasting peace. He was driven by the carnage of World War I, I believe, to do this. In this speech, Wilson visualized this organization to Congress. Groundwork was being laid for what he was ultimately a goal for, which would be the League of Nations. This was January of 1918. In December of 1918, the end of that same year, Wilson went to France and began the process of organizing his 14 points into what became the Treaty of Versailles. Everybody probably remembers the Treaty of Versailles from history. Well, on his return to the U.S. in July of 1919, Wilson had a treaty 
that included the concept for what was to become the League of Nations. All he had to do was to sell the idea. But Wilson had some opposition to this League of Nations concept. Henry Cabot Lodge, some of us older folks will remember the name Henry Cabot Lodge, a Republican congressman from Massachusetts. Cabot Lodge believed that the Treaty of Versailles and the League of Nations concept undercut the autonomy of the U.S. in international matters. Lodge was successful in keeping the U.S. out of the League of Nations because of his predominant role in the Congress. While Wilson was given the Nobel Peace Prize for his leading role as a creator of the League of Nations, he couldn't get it past Congress because of Henry Cabot Lodge. Go figure politics. The Covenant of the League of Nations was signed June 28, 1919 as Part 1 of the Treaty of Versailles and became effective on January 10, 1920. First meeting of the Council of the League took place January 16, 1920. The first meeting of the Assembly of the League happened November 15, 1920, just short of three years after Wilson had presented his 14 points to the U.S. Congress, but without the U.S. as a member of that League of Nations. However, the fact that the League of Nations existed was the world indicating acceptance of the concept of world government. Kind of etched that into your mind all the way back then. The fact the League of Nations existed was the world indicating an acceptance of the concept of world government. The first worldwide intergovernmental organization whose principal mission was to maintain world peace. That was the whole concept for the, its institution. It's interesting to note the fallibility of man in this. The permanent members of the Executive Council of the League of Nations was made up of four nations, and I find these four nations interesting. The four nations that made up this Executive Council of the League of Nations, the ones that were always there to run it, was Britain, France, Italy, and Japan. Twenty years later, Italy and Japan, along with Germany, would make up the axis coming against the world and the League of Nations in World War II. But before we get into that, the political, in more depth, Let's look at a primary driver of the world government enterprise. That primary driver of world government enterprise is economics. Economics. Following World War I, while the League of Nations was being set up, economic trade systems were emerging on an international basis. Europe seemed to be a trial region after World War I. The Belgium... Luxembourg Union was formed on July 25, 1921. The acronym formed from Belgium Luxembourg Economic Union was BLEU, B-L-E-U, BLEU. BLEU was created by treaty, went into effect December 22, 1922. Now understand that this was the ultimate beginning of what turned into the European Union. So way back then, Way back then, 1921, this joint venture of Belgium and Luxembourg, the Belgium-Luxembourg Economic Unit, was put into it, and it was successful. It was successful. It was only revised twice, that in 1935 and in 1944. In fact, this success led the Netherlands in 1944 to join with Belgium and Luxembourg to form what was called the Benelux. They were all in exile in England during World War II. They gathered together in London at that time in 1944 and put this together. And it was called the London Customs Convention, the meeting that they had. But officially titled... Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg Customs Convention. And we see the word customs in all of this because its purpose 
was to eliminate the need for border customs activities between the three countries. When you went from one country to another, you didn't have to change your currency. The currency you had in your pocket was worth three francs in Luxembourg. It was also worth three francs in Belgium. It was worth three francs in the Netherlands. So, this whole word customs in all of this, because the purpose of the Benelux, of these nations getting together, was to eliminate the need for border customs activities between those three countries. And the Benelux Customs Unit was the treaty established on September 5th, 1944. Benelux, of course, is an acronym of the first letters of each of these countries' names. BE, Belgium, NE, Netherlands, LUX, Luxembourg, Benelux. This was ratified, put together in London in 1944. This was ratified in The Hague in 1947 and came into force in 1948. Free passage was in place for any of those living in these three countries or moving across these three countries, if you had come in from outside, into one or more of the others. I can remember personally driving into Luxembourg with my family in 1958 when my folks came over to see Europe while I was stationed over there. And then after we crossed into Luxembourg, then simply crossing into Belgium as we headed for the World's Fair. All we had to do was hold up our passports, had the tag on our windshield, and we got waved right through. And then we went to the World's Fair and then simply crossed over into the Netherlands on our way back to where I was stationed in Germany. Same thing in effect. My thought then, of course, my thought then as a 22-year-old was how easy this was. Why don't all the nations do this? And, of course, I had no idea that this was working towards something that we ultimately don't want. I had no idea what this was working towards. The idea of centralized government over individual nations was what this was ultimately headed for. These three countries, Belgium, Holland, Luxembourg, the Benelux, went on to initiate a Benelux parliament over themselves that kept them, made them actually separate from the rest of Europe. And they did this in 1955, which set in place a stronger Benelux economic union, signed in The Hague in the 1958. Now, I want to step back just a, a few years. Um, these nations, the Benelux had formed, became part of the larger European coal and steel community, that which they've helped form, the Benelux. They helped form by including France, Italy, and West Germany, and they signed this on April 18, 1951. This came into force July 23, 1952. So you can see this is growing very gradually, very easily. And everybody who's watching this happen says, oh, wow, look at this. It's good financially. It's good for us. It's, it's something that we would. And this, of course, again, is a foreshadow of the European Union itself. Taking a step back in history again, remember that this started with blue, the Belgium-Luxembourg Economic Union, where the Belgian franc and the Luxembourg franc received fixed parity in 1922, a monetary union which existed until the euro and gave the picture for the reason to introduce the euro's common monetary unit into the all of Europe, the euro. The experience had been positive in the mind of average Joe citizen. The Treaty of Paris in 1951 established the European coal and steel community. Interestingly, it lasted exactly 50 years. 
July 23rd, 1952 to July 23rd, 2002. It was seen as creating diplomatic and economic stability in Western Europe after World War II. Some of World War II's main enemies sharing in the coal and steel production. They'd been enemies shooting at each other in the 1940s, and here all of a sudden they're mining and producing stuff together, economic profit. The European Declaration was signed by all leaders that were present for its signing. It was said that the treaty was what was giving birth to Europe. That treaty began the process. The treaty emphasized that the supra, S-U-P-R-A, supranational concept was the foundation for the new democratic organization of Europe that was beginning to emerge, if you will. Who opposed this supernatural concept being presented? Charles de Gaulle. I don't know if any of you remember Charles de Gaulle. I remember him very plainly. I had the problem of being stationed over there when he became president of France. And we had a squadron I had to visit in France out of Germany, and it became interesting. I won't go there. We're going to move away now from tracking growth of the New World Order by treaty. And let me pass out this sheet that uh, I've got here to help us understand. And we've got it up on our screen now. Now, the interesting thing about this is the we have looked at treaties to this point in the lesson. We have looked at treaties that have been used in creating what ultimately will become the European Union, one of the ten kings or kingdoms that are going to be part of the end time prophecy. All right. So we've looked at these few treaties and we've had, but if we look at this sheet that you've just been given, and there's enough for everybody to have one, if you've looked at these, you'll notice that beginning in 1947, there's a whole list of treaties that had to do with the forming of the European Union moving across that top of that chart that's there. Begins in 1947, goes to 2007, actually 2009 by the time we get to the enactment. What I want us to do is to look in here that in 1951, we've just, I think, talked about the Paris Treaty. This is where it begins, and it moves all the way from 1952 to 2002, as you remember. Then it shows these various treaties that were enacted. Modified Brussels Treaty, Roman Eurotome Treaties, Merger Treaty, etc., 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 all the way through until we get to 2007 and 2009 on the right-hand side of this which is titled the Lisbon Treaty, and if you look down below this, it says European Union, EU. It became a fact. But it took all of this business over these 1947 to 2007 years for them to slip enough of these changes on a consistent basis into the hands of the people and minds of the people so that it was perfectly acceptable by the time we got to 2007 to go ahead and vote in the Lisbon Treaty to create the European Union pretty much as it exists today. Now, that's, to me, pretty much a fascinating thing. There were 13 treaties involved in the building of the EU between 1947 and 2007. That last one, the Lisbon Treaty, finally bringing the EU into existence. So let's begin to look at the New World Order growth, all ten regions by maps. By maps. And we're going to start with one which, interestingly enough, was published originally in, of all places, Philadelphia. 
Now, why in the world would a map about the world government be published in Philadelphia? But that's the first of our uh, maps. When you get a copy of this, I want you to notice that there are specific colors on this map of specific areas, and these specific colors are going to be useful in us understanding what is going on within these particular things that are happening. Now, you see the ones that are looking gray, or it's actually blue on the original. This is talking about a part of the world that was laid out as this map was being drawn up in 1942. That's going to be what's controlled according to what they want in the New World Order by the United States of America. I guess I should start with this being titled Outline of Post-World War Map. The range and extent of World War II really gives an opportunity to begin thinking about dividing the world in its totality. In a modern context, it was a British man in South Africa named Cecil Rhodes that first proposed a world government be imposed. And this was in the 1880s. Rhodes suggested that world government be set in place. This is Rhodes, Cecil Rhodes' suggestion, that world government be set in place by the United States and the British Empire. They would be the ones who would control this being set up. I'm not so sure, but that this was preserving and expanding the British Empire, kind of as a secondary thing in his mind. After all, Rhodes gave his name to Rhodesia. He was a pretty heavy operator in that part of the British Empire. He was part of a group also of empire builders that created what they called round table groups. And they had their own round table group there in South Africa, but they created these round table groups all the way around the world. So they had scattered all the way around the world small groups that were tied with them and their thinking in that we need to create, at this point, a single world government. Now, we looked pretty thoroughly at Woodrow Wilson earlier, whose ambitions led to the League of Nations, which was a world government. There were a number of fascist regimes during the 1920s, 1930s, even the 1940s of the 20th century that also proposed some kind of a new world order. In fact, a lot of these fascist regimes classified themselves as a new world order that they were going to grow into dominance over. Nazi Germany could be listed as one of those, and perhaps the Japanese Empire could also. H.G. Wells. Anybody here remember H.G. Wells? H.G. Wells wrote War of the Worlds. Well, H.G. Wells was a proponent of a single world government, for those of you who didn't know. He did a couple of writings uh, about his activities concerning forming a new world order. One of them was called The Open Conspiracy. It was written in 1928. He talks about efforts to get backing for a world social democracy in the New World Order. Then he wrote one that he titled The New World Order in 1940, in which he talks about how a generation of struggle will be necessary to overcome opposition to a global government. Well, I think he's more than right there. But... But, 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 it was progressing, this move towards the one world government. And this brings us back to our 1942 map, if you will. Across the bottom of this map, do you see all the little writing across the bottom of this map that's too small to read up there off the screen? Across the bottom of the map are listed 41, count them, 41 items of thought about why we should draw this new world order map. 
why we should have this new world order in effect. Now, this 41 of these is really too extensive to dissect in its entirety, but to understand the thinking involved here, let's look at a few of these items and I'll, I'll read them to you, starting with number three of these little items. It says, a new world moral order, a new world moral order for permanent peace and freedom shall be established at the successful conclusion of the present war. Remember, this was published, was probably drawn in 1941, was published early in 1942. World War II still going on. And number three item that they listed in the things that it was all about was a new world moral order for permanent peace and freedom shall be established at the successful conclusion of the present war. They were setting themselves up to be in charge, if you will. That really lays out the desires of those behind this map that was, was drawn and laid out. But that's not all there. Let's go to item number four, which follows that immediately. Quote, For reasons of history, economic structure, favorable geography, and the welfare of mankind, the USA must altruistically assume the leadership of the new established democratic world order. See, they were going to make North America be in charge. And if you look at that map, you see all of a sudden North America includes a whole bunch of country that wasn't theirs then, isn't theirs now. But it includes Canada, Mexico, Greenland, the islands of the Atlantic, and most of the islands of the Pacific. That's the proposed new United States of America and its territories. Since this map was about a world divided between the U.S., Britain, and the Soviet Union. Let's move ahead and look at number 13 of the, that list of little figures under that map. By the way, this is online. I'll let you uh, uh, look up that on your own because you can find a copy of that um, that's written in letters long enough for, uh, for you to read. Anyhow, number 13 reads... The British Commonwealth of Nations, the second military and naval power of importance cooperating in a binding compact with the USA's, a power for freedom, shall retain and acquire control of such territories, and then I skipped ahead, as outlined on the map. All right, if you look in there, You'll find that England and Scotland are in red, and then if you'll look down here, Madagascar's in red, the Commonwealth nations are all in, in red, Australia, New Zealand, and, and etc. Now, in number 14, in essence, says the same thing about Russia, about the USSR. In effect, that they will be granted certain specific things. Now, I don't know how many of you remember the Yalta Conference where Roosevelt and Stalin and, and uh, Churchill all snuck out to the island of Yalta and divided the world amongst themselves before the end of World War II. And they did just that for the USSR. Look at the pink on your map here, and that is all that was going to be granted to the Soviet Union at the end of World War II as one of the three gave them the territories of Eastern Europe. Now I want to back up in our looking through these here to number 10. And that reads, the USA shall promote and assist in the unification of South America into a well-organized, democratic, federated United States of South America. That was to become our responsibility following World War II. Well, I find it interesting today that if we look, we look at our collection up here, the second one down to the left of center here in green, South American green, is the South American Union. 
as it exists basically in the world today. So this has become something that they talked about in 1942, becoming a fact, actually becoming a fact. Now, number 20, the continent of Africa shall be reorganized and unified as a dem demilitarized federation, Union of African Republics. Today we have an African Union as one of the ten of these units that the world will be divided into, and it's at the top center up here of our map. Now, understand this map was laid out in 1941. I want us to remember that. It was published in early 1942. Now, the next map we have that we're going to look at was published by the Club of Rome. Anybody know anything about the Club of Rome? The Club of Rome was a group put together that's whole business was to help set up this business of a world divided into 10 units. Now, if you notice here, there's a date on this that tells us in September 17th of 1973, the Club of Rome report entitled Regionalized and Adaptive Model of the Global World System has published here, and it has the world divided, if you will, into these different parts. A regionalized and adaptive model of a global world system. Now, the question that we have to ask, remember, 1941, they were into it well enough to be beginning to draw maps. Here's one in 1973 that has it broken down into 10. 10 is the number that's spoken of prophetically in the Bible that the world will ultimately be divided into. And this map was produced showing what they would like to see this be done in 1973. And the world yawned because they didn't have a clue. What's this talking about? This is a bunch of nuts. Don't worry about them. You know, that's, that's basically what this was all about. So, question becomes then, when did these ten kingdoms start gathering themselves into entities? Well, this began really all the way back if you want to, with Woodrow Wilson. But they're still morphing, because if you look at this carefully, the next map I show you is going to be just exactly like this. It's still going to be in units, and it's still going to be largely the same group, but it's not going to be exactly the same. But they're still morphing. But there's, I guess, pretty good estimates as to when these began to put themselves together. In 2009, as we looked about the EU in the Lisbon Treaty, it was established. Now, it has since changed a little bit. It has since changed a little bit. That, that's, that's, that's number one. Now, as we look through the rest of these, the Second one that I have on my list is called the Pacific Island Forum, which the Pacific Island Forum is this last low one here to the right of center with Australia, New Zealand, and some islands of the Pacific outlined in gray in this. This began through rough formation in 1971 as a South Pacific Forum, name changed to the Pacific Island Forum in 1998. Currently, it has an 18-nation or 18-state membership within that particular global unit. South Asian Association 
for Regional Cooperation, which includes India and Pakistan, was established December 8, 1985. It has eight state members when it was put together. It has nine observers who are deciding whether they want to join with them yet, and some of those are beginning to join with them because there's economic regions that if you're within this group, it's kind of like Belgium, Holland, and Luxembourg. You don't have to pay these excessive fees and taxes and etc., etc. Central American Integration System, which includes the Dominican Republic, was established in December of 1991. Remember that when we looked at this map here of 1973, this, the south of the Texas-Mexico border, all of this, and including the Caribbean islands, are part of the South American Union. Well, that was separated out. This was 1973. This was separated out, if you will, in 1991 created a Central American Court of Justice, they, which was, is kind of a Supreme Court. There's eight states, again, eight regional observers, and there's ten extra-regional observers. Next one is NAFTA, which is the United States, Canada, and Mexico. It was established in January 1st of 1994. It was done very low profile. It's kept that way. Watch. African Union was established July 9th, 2002. Now, the African Union is really almost ahead of everybody except the European Union. They have a flag for the African Union. They have an African Union legislature. They have an African Union army. They have an African Union court system. All 55 African nations belong to the African Union. There's one that's being set out temporarily because they did something they weren't supposed to, but they haven't been totally pulled down. Next, we're going to look at the ASEAN, the Association of Southeast African Nations, which was assembled August 8, 1965. It's really advanced. It's really advanced. It's advanced to the point that while he was president, Barack Obama every year went to their meetings. George H.W. Bush, I believe, went to their meetings. Our current president has gone to their meetings. They're a global economic powerhouse. This is this area, if you will, that's shown right across here, beginning with Southeast Asia, Vietnam, Laos, and so forth, and swimming all the way down into just north of Australia. That's one of the economic powerhouses. That's a scene could be one of the three that's taken over by the false messiah when he comes to power. Anyhow, it's a 10-state membership with two observers involved in it. Union of South American Nations became a legal entity on December 1st of 2010 when Uruguay signed on. It's a 12-state membership. Its headquarters are in Ecuador for this South American Union. They're just behind the African Union as far as being set up. They've got a group that meets twice a year. They have this, that, and the other thing. They also have nations that are in full rebellion right now with all kinds of problems. So there's stuff being worked out. Then there's the Commonwealth of Independent States, which is the former USSR. This was put up by Gorbachev, Gorbachev in March of 1991 with the dissolution of the USSR. There's nine member states, two associate states, and finally, our last one is China and Mongolia. That would be number 10. And it, the treaty was signed that merged them together into this in 1994. China is Mongolia's largest trading partner today. It's Anyhow, I find this whole thing to be extremely fascinating. 
put up that last map, if you will. That's a map of the way these states are currently today. Does everybody have a copy of that? This is the emerging New World Order and 10 economic unions. To absorb that from your little handout. The emerging New World Order and 10 economic unions. We'll begin on the left-hand side with the top one, which is the North American Union, which is blue, and it's exactly what is now being set aside or called the North American Union. Then there's the Central American Union that we looked at, and that's the area of south of Mexico, north of the South American continent, with all of the Caribbean islands, including Bermuda, listed in that. Then there's the South American Union, the European Union, the African Union. Then over on the right-hand side is the Middle Eastern Union. Notice that Egypt belongs to the Middle Eastern Union. They also belong to the African Union. Keep that in mind. Then there's the Russian Union, which is Russia and Mongolia and some of the former states of the Soviet Union that were hangers-on. Southeast Asian Unit, which is India and uh, Pakistan and the states to the above that. East Asian Union, which is China, Japan, and working its way down through Malaysia. The East Asian Unit, which is almost the same color and you can't separate them out, which is, again, uh, that Vietnamese group, so forth. And then the Pacific Union. And that's as it's being seen today, if you will, by those who are pretty much giving us power. Now think about this. Think about this. This all began with some wild thinking way back when. Some guy named Cecil down in South Africa. You know, that man went down there to become a farmer rather than go to school from in England. And he manipulated and manipulated and ended up along with a couple other people in control of the diamond industry of the world, which made him a multimillionaire. So he got to do things like create the state of Rhodesia and name it after himself. But he said, let's make a world government. And of course, he wanted to be part of the one who was running this world government. Bring this up to Woodrow Wilson. I don't know what Wilson's bottom line was, but he, after World War I, basically wanted to create a situation where the world could have peace. World War II proved that to be wrong because we didn't really get a world government, the United Nations, which could potentially have some control until after the League of Nations went away following World War II and the United Nations came into being. So the United Nations was formed with 50-some nations. Today, there's a hundred and some odd nations or members of the United Nations. Then we just progress this through and we get more treaties and we gradually build it up and we gradually build it up until we... Just the European Union had all those treaties. Can you imagine if we really took the time to uncover them dig the political sand away from them, how many treaties there have been worked out between Canada, the U.S., and Mexico, between the different states in South America, the different states in Africa. This is really something that's being, I believe, engineered. But we're being told in Revelation, in chapter 18, chapter 17 and 18, and really into 19, that we're going to have a situation at hand where there are going to be 10 states running the world, each governed by a separate group that are going to be taken over by a single individual, the false messiah, who will become ultimately the false messiah at the end of the age. And we're close enough here 
that all we would need would be a major economic jerk for each one of these to decide to go independent and be amongst themselves and take over and establish their own leadership. And then some one of these ended up being strong enough to take over two more so he can control three and probably have the economy and those three to force the rest of the seven to join with him. That's kind of laid out here on our chart. Daniel chapter 7 tells us that we're going to have Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and the Fourth Empire, which runs across here as imperialism. This is going to be joined by the seven heads and kings, starting with the Tarquin kings that go down and establish themselves in Italy and end up in the United States, the two-division stage and the one-world government stage. Ten kings in this one-world government stage, the ten kingdoms and the false messiah taking over just before Messiah returns and establishes a messianic kingdom. I will close with that because I'm out of time.